seven seconds between the time the light turned amber till the time she hit us in the middle of the intersection. The main message is getting out to young people in our community and their families the consequences of poor choices when it comes to drinking and driving, texting and driving, or distractive driving. Even sitting in the car before the police got me out, I just, hearing the sirens, you feel like it's actually happening. Working together with the emergency units in Haldeman County, they provide us with the information that we need to ensure what we are doing is accurate and it does portray reality. You see what's going on and you you can't help but react to everything that goes on around you. Um, you'd be pretty well lying to yourself when you're seeing somebody lying there on the on the ground with their guts pretty much hanging out. It's it causes you to react. I think it's, it's supposed to feel real because we're trying to show the audience what not to do because you never want to be in that situation. We didn't want them to think that this was a joke because it's not. Because this can happen in real life very quickly. Seven seconds that the woman had to decide to break, but because she was so drunk she couldn't. Seven seconds between the time the light turned amber till the time she hit us in the middle of the intersection. I came to, but I, I couldn't breathe. Everything was very tunnel vision. All I could see was right in front of me. I had no um, side perception, no depth perception. And I, I could hear Mike. And all he was saying was, just breathe, just breathe. And then I hear him open up the door and leave and yell, call 911. I wanted to make sure if we were OK, if we had any abdominal pain, if we were injured, um, where we had being like where we were coming from, what we had been doing, um, if it was our friends in the car, who in the car had been drinking, did we know the other people in the other car. I heard the generator for a long time. Um, I assumed that that was them cutting the, uh, the top of the car off, the trauma car, to get the uh, other victims out. This year's reenactment, we um, had to remove the roof from the vehicle, which required fire to follow a lot of different procedures to ensure that if there was broken glass or cutting through the metal, they're using the jaws of life to cut the roof. There's no harm done to the four victims that were inside the vehicle as well. I just think of how many things the, uh, the ambulance and the police and the fire department have to do in when they have to go to an accident like this. There was one young man who his role was um, an impaired driver an officer had arrived from Woodstock and he said that uh, they had arrested a 44-year-old woman and I was furious. I was furious that she was impaired. At that time the OPP did remove him from the vehicle and he was arrested, handcuffed and taken away. We had a young woman who played the mother of the driver who was charged with impaired and the brother who was the fatality who really portrayed what a parent goes through, not knowing what the results would be of their child being involved in a, a, a crash. Our crisis victim at that point, point he had minimal um, visible injuries, but um, fairly extensive internal injuries. And that was my first opportunity to move because all I, you know, I could feel my hands, I could feel my toes, so in, and like I'm telling him, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay, you know, I can, he's like, no, no, you need to, you need to stay where you are and we'll help you get out. And, uh, but I'm stubborn. And so when uh, they brought the, um, the gurney up to the door, I, I helped lift myself out. And when I did that, that's, that's when I felt the pain. That was the first time I felt the pain in my back. I had two fractured vertebrae in my lumbar region.
when he was extracted from the vehicle, he was put onto a backboard with um, collar, neck collar, oxygen, all of those things. The ambulance then took him away and brought them back to the trauma unit. The trauma unit went through all the steps that they go through as well. So there were, um, as I said, the, um, all the vitals were taken, assessments were done. It was communicated back and forth what was going on. You know, I'm strapped on this gurney and I can't, can't see anything because my head, you know, I can't move. I can only see what's right in front of me. And I, I saw my husband, Mike, and um, I said, where's Alex? And he said, he said, don't worry, he'll be, he'll get, he'll get better soon. And I was like, what do you mean he'll get better soon? And I think that was my first, the first time that it really hit me that something was really wrong with Alex. Alex was right behind me in uh, his car seat. And beside him was Max, who was four at the time. And then beside him in his car seat as well was um, Ethan, who was three at the time. They had the defibrillators going, they had oxygen going, they had, you know, all of those sort of things. So it was really very realistic this year, um, which just added a different element to our whole event. So it just kind of, again, it's all about education, being aware, um, and, you know, do you want to see yourself in this position? And I think it op opened eyes to a lot of young people. No breath sounds, no breath sounds on the lab. No and he was in the... Uh pediatric critical care unit at uh, the Children's Hospital there in London. Christopher, my nurse, got a call and said the other nurse that one of Alex's nurses is on his way that you need to go back and see him. And so I knew, I knew. And he had a syringe, a large syringe, and he was just trying to pump blood into his thighs through these two IV tubes and he was just pushing as hard as he could and he just looked at me and he said he said he's he's bleeding out and I don't know where I I don't know where from and I just kept praying please God don't let him die don't let him die don't let him die you know, the end result in in our um, reenactment was that the victim was a fatality it was a fatality and the victim didn't make it and they told us that uh, his brain stem had been completely severed and that there was nothing more they could do for him. At 6 a.m. he was pronounced dead. 11 hours later. Out here um, over the years and, and my time working in this community, I have seen a number of young, young fatalities in our community. That's why we started the whole education piece about, you know, um, don't let this happen to you. And yes, our focus was on the drinking and driving, but in, in the past few years it has grown. There's not just drinking and driving, there's drugs. Um, and there's the, the key one now is texting and driving and distractive driving. We feel by showing the consequences and the results of a car crash, we can save the life of one or many young people in our community. I think that being in a reenactment, you really realize what can actually go wrong and like that you do have to be careful. You know, I don't want to encourage drinking, but at the same time, I'm not going to tell you not to. But what I really wish you wouldn't do is drive after you've drank. That's, that's the part, because that's the part that kills, kills other people, and it kills their family, and it changes them forever. This crash could have been real life, and that would have been a very bad, and don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive.